Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 179. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tutors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of tutor themed goodies, you'll have access to patron only monthly giveaways. October's prize is a copy of a wonderful new book entitled Twas the Night Before Tudor Christmas. Thank you to Catherine Holman and Laura Loney for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. Next month, I'll be chatting to Philippa Lacey Brule from British History Tours about Tudor historic sites. Check Patreon for details. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tutors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag I love Talking Tutors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to discuss their book, Gloriana, Elizabeth I and the Art of Queenship, are Linda Collins and Siobhan Clark. Linda was employed by the Historic Royal Palaces for more than 20 years, whilst continuing her work as a freelance lecturer. Linda's lecturing career has taken her on tours throughout the UK, Europe, Australia and New Zealand. She's an accredited lecturer for the Art Society and president of her area Art Society. A member of the Association of Art Historians, Linda has spoken on various radio programmes, appeared in PBS TV documentary on Henry VIII and lectured for the Guildhall, London and the National Archives. Siobhan Clark has worked for Historic Royal Palaces for 20 years, delivering tours and lectures on the palaces of Hampton Court, Kensington, the Tower of London and the Banqueting House Whitehall. She has also lectured for the British Museum, National Trust and Smithsonian and is an accredited lecturer for the Art Society. Siobhan has featured on BBC Radio, Women's Hour and PBS Television's Secret of Henry VIII's Palace. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I am delighted to have Siobhan Clark and Linda Collins on the podcast today. So I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself. So maybe we'll start with you, Linda. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your background? Yes, my background. All right. Well, I was 23 when I started my first degree, and it was in early Italian art. I then took a master's on a French artist, Georges de Latour, from Alsace-Lorraine, and I was completely wrapped up in the French art of the 17th century. But then I started working at Hampton Court, and that changed my ideas on things. And of course, you had to embrace other history as well. So all of a sudden, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, all came to the fore. But French art is still a great big passion of mine. I enjoy it. How wonderful to work at Hampton Court. Absolutely. There was not a day when I walked through those big wooden doors at the front there and I didn't think how lucky I was. Not one day in over 20 years. (laughs) It's really quite overwhelming to be in there with all that history on top of you. Fantastic. So my background really is art historian and principally French art, apart from Hampton Court and the Judas. Wonderful. Thank you. And Siobhan? Yes, I just um, want to endorse what Linda said. I've worked at um, Historic Royal Palaces for more than 20 years. I'm still there. And um, yeah, you still feel I was there yesterday. (laughs) And it's still such an honour and privilege to to be there. Um, I just love conveying Tudor history um, to people in lots of different ways. Um, I've loved the Tudors since I was a child, even though I grew up in Scotland, in where the Tudors never reigned. And um, that's all I've ever wanted to do, really. So I work as a guide and a historian, and I write, obviously write books and lecture, like Linda. And I work with Alison Weir as well on um, on big sort of package tours of Tudor England. So yeah, that's that's my life really. Um, it does it, the Tudors really are my bread and butter. <laughs> Although I do um, also lecture on the Stuarts and work. I've worked a lot at the Banqueting House in Whitehall. So that is an, another area of expertise. And then apart from that, I'm I'm interested in in other. Um, periods of history though I wouldn't say I was an expert Wonderful. and like Linda I've um, I have been on television we were both on Secrets of Henry VIII's Palace and I've done done some radio um, as well. Wonderful thank you so much and we're actually here to talk about uh, a book the two of you co-authored so Gloriana Elizabeth I and the art of queenship so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind this book where did this idea come from? Well, it started with King and Collector, the first book that we did um, together. Well, it wasn't the first book that Linda and I did together. We did a big book on the Tudors, on the whole dynasty. But it was the first book that was uh, a kind of biography using art as a gateway. So King and Collector was the first one. And then it was Alison Weir who suggested that we follow up with Gloriana, which, which we did. And it was all during the pandemic, so there was plenty of time to write and we followed up very quickly, actually. We did King and Collector and then went straight into Gloriana. And the two kind of go together in a way. And it's just a new way. I mean, obviously, their lives have been covered so many times, so many biographies. This is just a fresh approach. It's a way of looking at their lives through the art, through the paintings, by taking uh, the most iconic works and exploring those works, um, exploring the lives of the monarch, and then um, also looking at some of the courtiers that that surrounded them, and in Elizabeth's case, of course, the cult of Gloriana. Uh, Linda, did you want to add something? No, no, you said, I was just going to say that it was, Henry VIII's art was great, and it was lovely that we were invited to do this book. And then naturally it would follow on that. I don't think we even had to send them anything, did we? We just said we'd like to do a book on Gloria. And they said, okay. I think after yeah. Henry, they, they trusted us, which was yeah. really quite flattering. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's a beautiful book. I, I, I love it. It had all those fantastic artworks that are in there. It's fantastic. And we're going to talk a little bit more about them in detail a little bit later. But before we do that, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the power of propaganda in Elizabethan England and perhaps the various ways in which art was used as a propaganda tool. Yeah, 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 sure. So I'm often asked, um, 
you know, was where did Elizabeth get the the influence uh, for this propaganda? And and it wasn't new. You know, her her grandfather Henry the Seventh and her father Henry the Eighth, of course, used art as propaganda and as a vehicle for magnificence. Even Henry the Seventh, who's a very famous miser, he said to have laughed in public only once in his life, and it's not you know, it's not the most popular of the Tudors. But he, in spite of the fact that he was a miser, he knew that he had to spend money on art and magnificence. So he spent money on expensive tapestries. He did commission um, artworks. And then his son took it even further. You know, Henry VIII had more tapestries than anyone in history, apart from the Pope and Louis XIV. And that was the most expensive art form of the day. But Henry also um, encouraged foreign artists and he had a genius, Hans Holbein. That's all covered in, in our book, King and Collector. So mm. Elizabeth would have been influenced by what had gone before, the way her grandfather and her father had used art. She also had to think very carefully about her image. A big part of Henry VIII's royal image was his view of himself as a chivalrous knight, as a warrior and someone who can lead the nation. And Elizabeth obviously can't do that. Um, the biggest obstacle that Elizabeth faced was her gender. But so she uses her femininity instead, becoming the unobtainable lady of courtly love. And you see that reflected time and again in the, in the artworks. Well, I was just thinking, I think it's quite interesting when we look back that we didn't want our royalty to be riding bicycles and live like us. They represented us and it was important for them to have this aura. And mm. it was essential part when you see this in paintings, of course, all the time. We didn't want them to be simple and look like us. There was a remark apparently of Henry VII that he had worn the same brown gown for the last two or three days. Well, they didn't want that. He has to go off and he has to shine and he has to represent us. And I think that's a big difference perhaps to today when we're calling for the royal family to be much more down to earth. The Tudors, they were all very good at, at propaganda and they were all interested in using artists and writers, particularly to convey their version of historical events. So, for example, the Wars of the Roses are presented as a dark time with the Tudors bringing in this golden age of peace and order and prosperity. And, and they did indeed come to symbolise the national character, the beginnings of the English church, the navy and the empire. And, and they, they very successfully impressed themselves on our consciousness. I mean, why is it today that no other royal family has impressed itself the way the Tudors have? Mm. People, so many people are fascinated by them. Just to give you an example of the propaganda in art, the clearest one that springs to my mind is the allegory of the Tudor family. It's, up, it's the family of Henry VIII and described as an allegory of the Tudor succession, attributed to Lucas de Heer. And Linda will, mm. will know whether that's right or not. He may, it may even be by Lucas de Heer. And this is the one where you've got Henry in the centre of the portrait with Edward kneeling by, the, by his side, carrying on, ready to carry on the tape of the, tape up the torch, as it were, of this new Protestant Reformation dynasty. And then you've got Mary on the left-hand side with Philip of Spain, followed by war, Mars, the god of war. On the right-hand side, you've got Elizabeth and her hand is in the hand of peace. So this is absolute <laughs> propaganda. And um, this was commissioned in Elizabeth's reign and it was actually commissioned after she had been not excommunicated, but um, the Pope had, had passed a bull. There was a famous papal bull against Elizabeth. And this this was probably in a reaction to that papal bull. And it's showing Elizabeth with peace, presenting Mary's reign as very dark and, and in times of war. And Elizabeth is, the, although Edward is there by his father's side, Elizabeth is the most prominent figure in the painting because she's actually the, his true successor. She's the one that's taking it forward and bringing the nation peace and prosperity. Absolute propaganda. And this is the kind of painting that, you know, copies would have been distributed. Yes, and I will share some of these portraits on, on social media for our listeners to, to see if they haven't already. But Linda, did you maybe want to tell us a little bit more about how Elizabeth used her portrait to develop and manipulate her public and her private image as well? I think, as we said earlier, on the whole, 
the portraits of Elizabeth did not change a lot. They were not Elizabeth, let's put it that way. Youthful face patterns um, of Elizabeth I had in, been employed by artists from around 1575. But from 1590, when she was in her 60s, Nicholas Hilliard invented this smoother skin, the more exaggeratedly youthful look um, that was known as the mask of youth. It didn't just improve on the Queen's features. This was the Botox of Botox. It, it actually <laughs> almost replaced the features. Uh, even at 67, we have this smooth skinned young virgin. The other thing about representation, representations of Elizabeth, though, the, it was the quality of the painting that changed principally. As English artists learned from their Netherlandish contemporaries, or some German as well, counterparts, and they became more accomplished in the art of painting. It was interesting too that all the pigments and the panels that you could have got in Antwerp, Brussels, or in Italy were available in England. But the English artists at the beginning of the reign didn't really know how to use them because we didn't have an apprentice system as would have been in Italy or, or in the Low Countries. So they weren't taught how to use them. Another change, I think, was the move towards the end of Elizabeth's reign towards canvas instead of panel. And that was quite an important thing. Canvas was easier to be bigger for a start. It was more easily produced and they could paint full length subjects. Now that the novelty of seeing this full length person standing in front of you, I don't think can be underestimated. It was a huge novelty. Elizabeth I in the Ditchley portrait of 1592, she must have looked really impressive to the contemporary eyes. And the earlier one, the Hamden portrait of 1563, which is another illustration in the book, even more so as it was the first one known of her. And that was on panel. It was then transferred from panel onto canvas, presumably for damage or for some other reason. But panel painting was preferred by the artists generally for Elizabeth, because of her clothes, her jewels, a panel prepared was a much smoother surface to work on than a canvas with its weaving. They much preferred to use the, the panel to begin with. So yes, it did change, um, but I don't think images of Elizabeth changed as much as we expected them to change. When we look at her as a young princess, as we probably will do later, that's very young, she's 13, she looks apprehensive. That is probably the, the best way of seeing her in her early years. Because once the artist got hold of these face patterns that were insisted on being used, we just see the same face reproduced. So no, I, I don't think representations of her changed hugely over the years. But always interesting. Yes, absolutely. And they're still quite astounding to see them today, those full length portraits. So I imagine that they must have had such an effect in, the, in, in Tudor times as well. But I know when I, when I often post portraits online, people are always very interested to know about what does this mean? What, what is this symbol? So I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of those symbols that were really regularly associated with Elizabeth the sure. First. Of course, the Tudor Rose to represent the unity of the realm. But it also had, we must remember, religious connotations. The rose was a medieval symbol of the Virgin Mary that could allude to Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. The other thing, what do we always notice in Elizabethan portraits, pearls. And I was just looking the other day, actually, Elizabeth I owned the Medici pearls that were a gift to Catherine of Medici from her uncle, Pope Clement VII. They were said to be the largest pearls ever seen and in 1533, they were valued at 27,900 gold EQs, which today apparently works out at around 8.1 million pounds. Four of the largest pearls were incorporated into the Queen's imperial crown in 1838 by Queen Victoria, and they rest there still. But the other surprise for me anyway, was that many of the pearls came from the Americas. When we think today of wearing another surprise, pearls associated with Elizabeth, we're used to seeing, well, I'm wearing them today, actually, we're used to seeing pearls. But you can pick up pearls very cheaply today. In Elizabeth's time, there were no fake pearls. And so what she's wearing are real. And when you look at the number of them, 
It's a huge amount. And I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a, a jeweler, an, a historical jeweler. And he said she's got so many because she must remember that she was the only one who could afford them. They were so, today, everyone can afford a pearl, but not in Elizabeth's time. So trying to see it through the eyes of her contemporaries, these would have been stunning. They're round, they're white, they're likened to the moon, of course. And the Greek goddess of the moon was Cynthia, a virgin, therefore pure. Uh, Walter Raleigh wrote a long poem in the late 1580s, The Ocean's Love to Cynthia, in which he compared Elizabeth I to the moon. So the pearls are very, very relevant to her. Also the sieve, as Javon will say earlier, the sieve in ancient Roman times, the vessel virgin Tugja reputedly proved her purity by carrying water in a sieve. So it became a symbol, not just of purity, it glorified Elizabeth's virginity, but it also associated England with the Roman Empire, with a historical source at the same time. So yeah, Tudor rose, pearls, um, the sieve, the moon, of course. Yvonne can come up with some different ones if you want to. Yeah, the globe representing the globe. imperial ambitions. Now that appears in the sieve portrait and also obviously very prominently in the Armada portrait with the Queen's long white fingers resting on the globe and specifically in the Americas and uh, showing that England, now they've defeated the Spanish Armada, but English ambitions stretch way beyond Europe now. It, it really is the beginning of imperialism. Um, and then you've got uh, crown and scepter signifying monarchy and the body politic. In the ermine portrait, she holds in her right hand an olive branch for peace, but her, or her left hand is near a sword, showing that she's ready. She wants peace, but she's ready to fight if necessary. Um, and then there's the pelican and the phoenix, um, the two very famous portraits by Hilliard, which people can see in the National Portrait Gallery. The pelican was one of Elizabeth's favourite symbols, and it portrays her motherly love for her subjects and that's all tied in with the image of the virgin as she's not married to a mortal man she's mother of her people she's married to England she actually said that herself so th there's lots of symbols that um, that people can can look out for in the in the portraiture and getting back to what you were asking um, earlier her, her portraiture was very important um, to Elizabeth for political ends, even right from the beginning, the, the coronation portrait and then the Hamden portrait of Elizabeth as, as a very young queen, which was painted for the royal marriage market. The Sieve portrait that we've already mentioned is concerning her as a virgin. It was probably commissioned by Sir Christopher Hatton, emphasising her identity as a maiden. And the Armada portrait, absolutely um, political, painting that listeners will immediately be able to um, to visualize full of, of symbols of English triumph and um, and imperialism so these are ways in which she uses her um, her portraiture for political ends and, and she can very much manipulate um, her public her um, and private image through art and, and and as Linda was saying earlier the idea about her not ageing, you know, is yes. complete manipulation. But I have to emphasise that this is not all about vanity. It's because this, the succession was so um, unpredictable. You know, it's everybody knows she refused to name a successor. To be honest, people at the time don't want to think about the time when the Queen will die because they're not exactly sure what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rather frightening. It's a bit like, I mean, Elizabeth I came to the throne at 25, the same age as Elizabeth II. They both had these incredible long reigns, both women, brilliant queens, completely made queenship a career, you know, sense of duty. There are parallels between the two Elizabeths. And both had such long reigns that by the time they died, people alive cannot remember a time when they were not Elizabethans. You know, that's how we feel today. And that's how they felt in 1603. But at that, but back then, it, it would have been quite scary until they realised that actually Robert Cecil had everything in hand and had already arranged everything with King James and the succession actually turned out to be peaceful and smooth. But that wasn't thanks to Elizabeth. 
she had never named or acknowledged James as her successor, not not until apparently the very, very end, when she's literally, you know, in her last breath. I'd quite like to make a point there between the private and the public images of yeah. the Queen, because her image appeared on no end of things, coins, for example. Yeah. But so few of the portraits were painted from life because of this mask. So private images of Elizabeth I are pretty rare. The Darnley portrait was painted from life, we think, and may have been commissioned by a courtier who was close to the Queen. Um, but generally, Elizabethan portraiture is set between the work of Holbein in the 1530s, looking at those pictures behind Duron there, and Van Dyck, 100 years later or so. They didn't have the openness of Holbein. We all think we can look at a Holbein and we can see their personality. We don't know because five, 600 years ago, without photographs, without videos, we don't know, but we like to think that Holbein painted an open, frank character. And then we've got Van Dyck, who painted the beautiful courts. You can imagine the beauty of these women. The, the, it was a different sort of frankness, but you still saw their personality. But then we have the Elizabethan image, which is so full, as we've just said, of signs and symbols that these sort of hide controlled images, uh, courtly images, it's hard to see the real person. If you look at an Elizabethan portrait, you do not get that same feeling of being able to know them from it. And so her public image, I, I believe, was manipulated to a fine degree. And one yeah. thing we yeah. also have to remember in any art historical context is that we don't know what we've lost. We can only judge the period of art on what is left to us. So we have to remain a little bit open-minded about that, but I would say that private images of Elizabeth I are far too rare to be able to evaluate them. Actually, it's, it's fascinating to think about what we might have lost. For example, there may have been miniatures that she had commissioned for maybe someone like Robert Dudley, someone with- who Absolutely. Yeah, um, the, the most private one that I can think of is the Chequers ring, which yes. yeah. I'm, I'm sure listeners uh -huh. will be aware of, which was intended to be private. It was this, this yeah. wonderful ring that opens up and it has Elizabeth on one half and it's a lock, being a locket ring. We've got Elizabeth on one half and Anne Boleyn on the other. Um, it's in a private collection at Chequers. Listeners, um, I'm afraid... Uh, probably won't be able to see it in reality but you can see pictures of it online now and again it goes on display in exhibition a very beautiful uh, piece of jewellery that was mm. very something obviously very important to the queen and a very private image yes one of my favorite um, artifacts that one actually I, I love it I have not seen it in person yet so I'm hoping one day it goes on exhibition again so I can see it um, I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about so we've talked about the importance of Elizabeth's image but in what ways was it distributed throughout her realm and and even beyond as well well as Linda was saying you've got coins you've also got printing engravings um, were available at the time uh, people did know what she looked like, or, or they rather they got the image that Elizabeth wanted them to have. And even in the in the art market, it was very common if if someone commissioned their painting, and then they they didn't pay. Um, it was very common for an artist to simply turn the panel into a portrait of the Queen, because if he did that, he would know that he could sell it. People wanted pictures of Elizabeth. It's a way of showing your loyalty to the Queen. So her, her portrait would be hung in private houses and places like town halls. Um, th th there would be various places where her portrait would be on, dis on display. So in that way, it was, it was, I think it was probably fairly easy to distribute it by this time because of printing and engraving. Certainly her, her image was, it's been suggested that her image was more widely distributed than any woman up to that time, except for the Virgin Mary. And, and I also thought, perhaps Linda, you might talk to us a little bit about the different art forms that, that flourished during the latter part of Elizabeth's reign. Well, I mean, very different art forms. Of course, you've got the theatre, you've got poetry, you've got um, writings, etc., masks. But as an art historian, the one I think is most 
interesting at that time is the development of miniatures, miniature portraits. Because in the early years of Elizabeth's reign, English portraiture was far less accomplished than that of the European artists. But in the field of miniature painting, that soon began to change. And it changed principally due to the skill of one man, Nicholas Hilliard. And he was born in Exeter in 1547. He was the son of a successful goldsmith whose work actually, there's some in the British Museum, which is interesting, of Hilliard's father. And he himself became a goldsmith. He was a very ambitious man. He claimed to be self-taught in art, but that's doubted by art historians because of the quality of even his early work. But it still remains unclear how by 1571, Nicholas Hilliard was painting Queen Elizabeth I. It's an amazing jump from a goldsmith and relatively unknown to suddenly you're painting the Queen. By the 1580s, another thing that amuses me is that Nicholas Hilliard was earning more for painting a miniature portrait than most people earned in a year. He could paint one portrait and, and make more than many people would have dreamed of earning. The portraits of him, however, don't show him as an artist. He is wearing um, wonderful clothes suitable to a high level courtier. He has a beautiful ruff. He is uh, painting himself as a very good looking man. So he obviously yeah. decided he wanted more. But I think the change really by the 1580s, he created a new sort of painting that had never been seen before. When we go in stately homes, you often see the full length portrait above the fireplace. Well, he took that full length portrait and reduced it from life size to miniature around the size of a five pound note. I mean, just absolutely incredible. And the way he painted as well is, when painted Elizabeth I, for example, in a miniature, she is at least 62 in the one I'm thinking of. Her face is perfect. She's wearing this enormous ruff. And his skill, which again had not been done before, is that the lace collar fills the frame, but he produced this lace collar by mixing the paint almost as though you were mixing icing sugar for a cake so that he could drop it onto it and this meant it was really thick but when it dried it looked just like lace because in in light in directional light the shadows were created that made it look just like a real lace collar I, I think he was a great artist obviously don't think I'd have liked him much of a person. <laughs> Not my sort of person. But he was portraitist to the Queen for 32 years, but he always lived beyond his means. He was even in prison due to debt, um, in Ludgate for debt, for example. And when he died in 1619 at 72, there wasn't even the money to pay the legacies in his will. He lies today in an unmarked grave in central London at the back of St Martin's in the Fields, as you obviously know it around there, but say I'm marked, so we have no way of um, paying homage to him. Um, interesting, and I think the miniatures is one way where art really was new and changed. Hmm. From then, we never look back. And, and very important, because for the first time, the English are not only competing with European art, but surpassing it in the field Absolutely. of miniatures. Absolutely. Yes, that's a pity that we don't know where he's buried. Uh, such a great artist. That's that's such a pity. But so can you tell us, we've talked about Nicholas Hilliard and earlier you mentioned the cult of Gloriana. So can you tell us about some of the other authors or musicians or and artists as well who helped actually promote and develop this, this cult of Gloriana? Okay, well, the first thing to say is that a long reign provides stability. It allows the arts to flourish. And when we think of the Elizabethan age, we immediately think of Shakespeare, uh, Spencer. There's so many. I mean, John Donne, it just goes on. The list goes on as far as literature is concerned. It's an it's a absolute flowering of literature. Um, Spencer, in particular, um, writes about Elizabeth, the fairy queen. Is he, she is the muse. Um, it, it's all part of the cult of, of courtly love, actually. I mentioned right at the beginning how she uses her femininity because she cannot present herself as a warrior. So she's the unobtainable lady of courtly love. And all of these, um, all of her courtiers, 
all of these artists and writers, etc., um, are looking upon Elizabeth as this beautiful um, goddess. She's up there on a pedestal. And this carries on, right, even when she's very old, you know, they're still telling her that they're dazzled by, by her beauty and that you get the, the poems, you get, and also let's not forget the music of Talus and Bird. One thing that Elizabeth did that's very important is she saved church music. Her religious settlement was a hybrid of Protestant liturgy with Catholic traditions. Church music in particular was under fire from Puritans. It had disappeared during the reign of her brother Edward, reintroduced by Mary. And then in her own reign, there were pur by Puritans in Elizabeth's reign. Um, I, I mean Puritans who they, they thought they felt they wanted to purify the, the church to remove all Catholic traditions. And uh, they wanted to get rid of church music. She saved it. Talis and Bird were actually Catholics, but they were able to continue working on, in the Chapel Royal under the Queen's protection and produce the most glorious music of the, of the period. And, and so indeed, indeed, some of the music is, is absolutely inspired by Elizabeth herself and is just gorgeous. Linda's already explained about Hilliard, the most important artist who promoted the cult of Gloriana through these incredible uh, paintings with the mask of youth and all the images that and, and all the symbols and images that we described earlier. And of course things like silversmith, silver, domestic silver flourished during the reign of Elizabeth and there was one particular man who I really like his name is Affabel Partridge. Now, what <laughs> Affabel Partridge, I think you imagine this little plump man with, with a little cheeky smile. And he, he was mentioned in many records during Elizabeth's time, but I noticed here, um, he was last mentioned in 1568. We don't know what happened to him, but his work lives on in the Met Museum in New York. There's a wine cup and a cover, a cover by him which are conserved. A Nautilus cup created from a shell is in the v &A Museum in London, and a cup made by him for Sir Nicholas Bacon, the Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, in the 1570s remains for us to, to see. But one thing I loved was his little cheeky image seemed to work with my feelings and, and how he produced the cup for Nicholas Bacon, because he engraved the cup with a wild boar, because a boar is bacon. <laughs> and I thought that was a wonderful pun on the name of Sir Nicholas Bacon in a very grand form. So yes, silver, of course, replaced the wooden of the early Tudor times. And, and it's, yeah, I was just gonna say, and also there's the field of architecture, the great prodigy Absolutely. houses. That's, that's many of which are still left to us. You know, I'm thinking of Hatfield, Burley, incredible houses, and then also um, embroidery. And we have, of mm. course, the Bacton altar cloth that yeah. the listeners may be familiar with, but even believed to be a fragment of a dress that, that Elizabeth once wore and, and a wonderful example of Elizabethan embroidery and the skill of, of the people mm. who were able to make it. Yeah, there's a picture of it, actually, in our, our book called yep. Back to Nautical Cloth. The wonderful thing about that is it, it presumably came from a dress. Um, there's been suggestions that it was the rainbow portrait. There are arguments against that, of course, because the it's dates not, don't tie up. And, right, but the lovely right, thing for me is it was on the wall of this church in Herefordshire for years. Yeah. And before that, I think it slept under the vicar's bed. <laughs> just laid there sleeping away over the years nobody really taking much notice until it was discovered to to be there and actually be elizabethan embroidery but the good yeah. thing of course it's been under his bed for a long time it stops the fading <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. Tracy, it was tracy that found it just i know we had a bit of a problem didn't we because we didn't realize that immediately and we changed it in our book, luckily, just yeah. before it was printed, because Tracy yeah. is such a modest person. She didn't like to tell us. She'd read the book and she didn't like to say it was her. Oh, yeah. she's lovely, Tracy. She's absolutely lovely. Yeah. 
And and so you've mentioned quite a few artworks during our chat today, but I, I can't let you go without asking you just to tell us about a few more of, of the key artworks of Elizabeth's reign that you feature in your book. Well, I think, how many would you like? I could do Elizabeth as the princess, the coronation portraits. Well, yeah, they, they both sound fantastic. They, I love those two. So, yes. Elizabeth as princess, lovely, because she looks so innocent. She's only 13. We know she's wealthy because of the crimson silk of her gown. Even more expensive is when you see this portrait, underneath the crimson silk, you can see tissued fabric. And this was probably made in Florence, and it was more expensive than the silk. Sumptuary laws said that it was only to be worn by the royal family, so you would guess that she is a princess. She's standing in the portrait, almost as though she's been disturbed. She's got her finger in the book, perhaps reading a text. She spoke languages, she spoke Greek and Latin. And for, well, immediately as the picture was being painted, behind her were classical references that have been erased and replaced by curtains. So I was looking closely. You can see as some of them have come through the thin paint. But looking closely at the picture, her girdle, she's got this pretty little girdle, her, her belt that hangs around her waist. And if you enlarge it or look very, very closely, the classical vases, which would have tied in with a more classical reference. So I think she's probably saying she was very highly educated. Um, this is my education. But it is a beautiful picture. Few things we don't know about it. Why the Bible on one side, well, it's called a Bible, but it's actually blank. Why is the book on the left blank? We don't know. What is the book she's holding? We don't know. But with those classical references, in this, I, I feel as though she wants to be proud of her education. And when you look at the face, put yourself <laughs> in the position of a contemporary looking at this. She's 13. She's got this beautiful face, which I think the artist has really, it was Guillaume Sparks, has, has captured really well, apprehension. She has no idea at this time that her father was to die within a year. Her brother Edward would die as a young king. Her sister Mary would only rule for five years. And that in 12 years time from that portrait, she will be crowned Queen Elizabeth I of England. I, I just love the look on her face. That's what does it for me. So that's one of my favorites. Did you want to tell us about the, the coronation portrait? Which is coronation a portrait, certainly. Well, it's to me, it's rather strange. It's called a portrait because there's very little of Elizabeth I in this. If you don't know the picture, she, it's the dress, which is the star. All there is showing of Elizabeth is the round circle of her face and part of her hands. But the reason for that is that this portrait, called a coronation portrait, it's oil on panel, still at uh, 1600. It is 1600. I haven't made a mistake. I'll tell the listeners why in a minute. And it represents her role not hers. It's representing the body mortal will die. That will disappear. She will turn to ash and, and be buried. But the body politic is the role of the monarchy, the actual job, if you like. And that's the one that is being praised and will continue. The robes also I found amusing were Mary's, her sister, who she didn't get on with, who she was not particularly fond of, and it was worn by Mary for her coronation in 1553. Elizabeth was taller, you just look at the portrait, slimmer. <clears throat> and so there's a record of four yards of silver tissue, which was bought in at four pounds a yard, which is incredibly expensive to make a new bodice and sleeves. The other thing, she was beautiful by 16th century standards, her hairline, her eyebrows being a, a redhead were probably fairly thin anyway, but the hairline would be plucked to make the face look longer and slimmer. Her style is in that of a, a young virgin's uh, tradition. And probably she would have commissioned a coronation portrait. We don't know. This is one of the other lost treasures, if you like. But with modern technology, dendrochronology can analyze the tree rings of the wood in the panels on which it was painted. And we know that during her coronation, that tree was still growing. So this is not a coronation portrait. The panels actually have been dated to 1589. So Elizabeth was 57. 
She'd been queen for 30 odd years. At the earliest date, this coronation portrait could have been painted. But then you think, well, why would someone want to recreate a coronation portrait of Elizabeth when she was 57? And it could have been, and I think this is something always to remember first of all in art history, a copy of the lost original. It could have been. We don't know unless the original turns up. It could have been made for the festivities of her accession day on November the 17th, or even for her funeral in 1603. So it raises more questions than it answers, but we do know it was, it's 1600, it's not a coronation portrait. And I like it for that. Now, towards yeah. the end of our episodes, what I like to do just to get to know our guests a little bit better is to play what we call a game of 10 to go. So these are just 10 very quick questions just to get to know you. Okay. And I'll just I'll just split between the two of you since we've got two all guests right. today, if that's all right with you. So Siobhan, can you tell us about an inspirational place that's close to you that you love to, to visit? Yes. Um, well, if... Hmm. <laughs> um, all of the... HRP palaces and um, I you know I'm, I'm actually really really fond of the banqueting house at Whitehall which sadly is not open to the public at the moment I, I hope that one day it will be open again to visitors um, but apart from HRP I always love Heber Castle there's something very special yes. about going down there I love the gardens just the whole thing um, I mean I'm sure you probably agree with me Natalie yes I do wholeheartedly <laughs> a bit there <laughs> And, and staying there as well, the fact that you can stay there is just, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, that's definitely close to my heart. Absolutely. And and Linda, do you have a signature recipe that you're known for? I, think I, I do, actually. <laughs> because, excuse me, when the, the family come round, I make a sausage pasta, which goes down well with adults and children. And we were stuck in a traffic jam just outside Naples Airport. And our taxi driver spoke English. So we started to converse. I think I heard every recipe that his mother had produced for him as a child. But the one that stuck out was the sausage pasta. And he said to me, you must put fennel in it. Uh It has to have fennel, which is something we don't always think of in England. So I do recreate his recipe for sausage pasta with fennel when the family come. Oh, that's a lovely story. I love that. That's really lovely. And uh, Siobhan, what was the last book that you either purchased or, or perhaps that you that you read? Um, well, the most recent, I've, I've just recently received a couple of books, actually, um, from friends. Sarah Griswood's The Tudors in Love, um, which I'm really looking forward to reading. And The Queens of the Age of Chivalry from Alison Weir, which isn't my period, but I it's, <laughs> I actually helped work on the book. I did the index for it. So I um, absorbed a certain amount of it while I was working on it. So I'm looking forward to just enjoying uh, reading it. Well, they sound wonderful. I always, my, my to-be-read list gets so much longer during these episodes because I'm adding everyone's books. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so, Linda, what would be an ideal Sunday morning for you? Ideal Sunday morning is probably not to get up. (laughs) I'm a late night person. And if I'm working on something, I probably don't go to bed until two. Oh, wow. And which means that come seven o'clock, I'm not ready to get up. Yeah. So when uh, friends or family turn up all bright and breezy for brunch (laughs) at 10, no, that's not me. My favourite Sunday would be to lie in and then gradually get up gently and maybe sit in the garden if we've got lovely weather. And have it absolutely calm if I can. Um, but it rarely happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds good. And and Siobhan, you were talking earlier about other periods of history, perhaps that you might be interested in. So if it's not the Tudors, what other periods do you like to, to study or, or read about? I'm actually, well, Rush, oh, it's quite diverse, I'm afraid. Um, Russian history, I did that at university. So I'm still fascinated by the Romanovs. And I, I do actually quite like American history. I'm interested in the American Civil War and the American Revolution. Um, went to see Hamilton, which I loved, and uh, and that kind of got me interested again. I'd like, I'd like to, when I've got time, I'd like to actually delve 
a bit further into that. I'm always amazed by the amount of America, Americans who come over. And we've had a lot of American visitors this year, which is wonderful, coming over to Hampton Court. And it's amazing. You know, they have this fascination for the Tudors. When you think, you know, how many British people know about American history? Probably not a lot. Um, yes. Yeah. So, but I, I yeah, I, I find their history quite really interesting as well so I'd, I'd like to I'd like to read a bit more of that wonderful and and Linda do you have any pets I don't <laughs> have a pet we used to have a dog and I know why Siobhan's laughing but we have my son lives two minutes from here right and he has the most adorable French bulldog oh, called oh. Coco oh. and they're they're working he and his wife are working and so often she'll come here to have a sleepover and oh, I take so her for a walk. <laughs> and for Halloween, I took her to the shop and we bought a spider outfit for her. <laughs> <laughs> and a pumpkin hat to go with it. <laughs> oh, that is so cute. I don't have any pets, but I do have a great fondness for Coco the French bull. Oh, <laughs> Linda, I think you're going to have to send us a photo so that I can oh, see yeah. that. Because I'm just like, I can easily do that. <laughs> That would be I'll send you a photo. <laughs> Please do. That would be so cute. That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and Siobhan, when you were when you were younger, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you were older? What was your sort of dream? I actually I did want to be a historian. Did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And didn't think that it would ever happen. And because uh, I remember uh, someone saying, "Oh no, you can't do that. You've got to. You have to be able to write books." <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's a dream. My dream came true. So my advice to anyone would be don't ever give up. If you feel passionate about something, you know, stick, stick with it. Stick with your first love and yes. uh, never give up. Yeah, that's really good advice. So uh, one last question for you, Linda. What is a mystery that you would love to kind of solve or know the answer to? It could be a historical mystery or something more contemporary. No, it is a historical mystery, actually. I worked at the palaces like Siobhan for over 20 years. And outside the Chapel Royal, the Royal Chapel, we, we had an incidence of a lot of people, particularly young girls, feeling unwell. Wow. And Siobhan will back this up. And apparently during my time there, someone went through the accident book and found out that there were an abnormal amount of young girls claiming to feel faint outside the chapel. And of course, that was the chapel where Catherine Howard got news that her future didn't look too rosy, shall we say. Yes. yes. And it's felt that under this particular chandelier, it, it had been picked up by some of these young girls, but an abnormal amount. And it took a long time for it to be picked up. So there may be something in that. I would like to know more. I've had a, a ghostly experience there, which was never explained. I was working late one night with a, a group who were having a business reception. And I thought, I will pop to the ladies' loo before I go home. And I could feel footsteps, heavy footsteps behind me. And I assumed it was a warder, the same thoughts as me. So I stepped aside and I said, oh, after you, you're obviously more of a hurry than me. And there was nobody there. And all I heard was a whoosh. And in my head, it was the whoosh, you know, when you rub taffeta together, I could see purple taffeta. And I started running and I got faster and faster as the time went on to get to my car. I forgot all about going to the loo. And when I got to the entrance, the palace police were there. And one of them was a man I'd known for many years. And he said, whoa, what's the matter? And I said, well, this has just happened to me. I was totally out of breath. But, and he said, oh, not that old one again. <laughs> so wow. obviously wow. not the only one who has had that experience. Oh, fantastic. Oh, there's definitely an atmosphere there for sure. I have no doubt about it. It's a very special place, isn't it? And Siobhan, just, uh, just to finish off, something that you're looking forward to perhaps in the you know next six months or so? coronation <laughs> oh yes you oh, do have course. a coronation of course coming yeah. up <laughs> yeah that that will be very very interesting and uh, yeah I think like most people and perhaps your listeners I'll be I'll be watching it um, I don't know about going up to London but I'll certainly be um, be watching it live I think that would be fascinating 
Absolutely. And, th and there is one final thing that um, I do ask, and that is for a Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners to go off and explore after the show. Sometimes people suggest um, a book to read, a song to listen to, just something to nurture their love of Tudor history. So maybe, Linda, would you like to go first? I've got one. You can see I'm raring to go here because <laughs> yeah, I looked right. at it last night. And it's the HRP website, which is www.hrp.org. UK and it's changed regularly and there's lovely little snippets for example last night I was I learned 1.3 million logs were burned every year to feed the court of 1200 and that Henry VIII had to order the scullions the kitchen lads to stop going about naked <laughs> so that would have been something for the eye or they must not wear vile garments so I, I really like that site. It changes regularly and it comes up with some fascinating facts. Wonderful. And I'll add a link to that in the show notes, make it easy for everyone. And, and Siobhan, did you want to add anything? Yes, I would actually. Um, so I was recently um, very kindly sent a fantastic magazine called Tudor Places from Deborah Royal, who, um, who's produced this. And it's just wonderful. Um, it's a magazine that people can subscribe to and it focuses on Tudor buildings, but also stories connected with um, uh, people past and present with contributions from lots of brilliant historians. Um, so just to give you an example, um, edition one includes Anne Boleyn's apartments at the Tower of London. So really fascinating. And uh, I would recommend that if people are interested. So it's called it's just simply called Tudor Tudor Places and you can subscribe to, to the magazine. Fantastic. Thank you. And I, I know that they do both print and digital as well. So if you're overseas and, you know, you prefer to get a digital copy, that's absolutely fine. And, it, and it's beautiful quality, the magazine. I, I have the same issue that you that you yeah. have. So, ladies, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I really highly recommend everyone go and have a look at your beautiful new book, which is so lovely. And it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming on the podcast and talking Tudors. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. <music>